Amen. Thank you very much. Let us stand and say together the Lord's Prayer as our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. In 2011, a Hinnadab Finn moved his wife and his two young daughters from London to Etin, Kenya. He's 37 years old. When Finn was a junior high and high school student, he was an above average runner. He went on to college, and ran in a few club races, but nothing serious, no serious training. After college, he took a job with Runner's World magazine and began writing articles about running, and then he began training himself just a little more seriously than he did. Now, you need to know that Finn is an above-average gifted runner. Even without serious training, he's running 16, 17-minute 5Ks. That's, that's 3.1 miles in 15, 16, 17 minutes. That's, that's really good. For an old fat guy like me, I'm satisfied with 21. So just realize he's very gifted. But he got to wondering, of the thousand or so elite runners in the world, why are the Kenyans always on top? Why do they always win the world's marathons? What makes the Kenyans better than the rest of us? So he moves his family to E10, and he's going to train with the Kenyans for six months to run the Lewa Marathon. The Lewa Marathon is a marathon that's run through a game refuge. It's very difficult. It's run on dirt paths in high altitude in the heat. They, it is so difficult that this is one of the few marathons in the world that provides a helicopter to pick up people off the course. He's going to train for six months, running with some fast and some slow Kenyans as he prepares. Now, you need to realize a slow Kenyan runs a two-hour and 20-minute marathon, and a fast Kenyan runs two hours and five minutes or something like that. Extremely fast. And he's going to figure out why they are so much faster than the rest of the world. And so he clocks off the things that he learned. Part of it is the altitude. Running at 8,000 feet does prepare you to run at sea level much more quickly. Part of it is the culture. Running is accepted. A few years ago, some bicycle companies came into Kenya. We're going to teach some of these endurance athletes how to ride the bicycle for the Tour de France. And people just laughed at them and they would not train. Part of it is the focus. When you ever you go into an, a Kenyan training camp, prepare for a marathon, that is all you do. You run, you eat, you sleep. And a Kenyan will sleep 16, 18 hours sometimes on during training days. American runners, Western runners, they'll train early in the morning and then they'll go shopping and go to the movies in the afternoon and go out for dinner. Not a Kenyan runner. A Kenyan runner is there to run and run only. Part of it is barefoot running as children. They run barefoot and they learn to strike with their forefoot and their heel never touches the ground. And if you want your children to run fast, you need to take their shoes away from them or buy the toe shoes so that they learn to run with the pull of the forefoot and their heel never strikes the ground. That's part of it. Part of it's the menu. They eat a kind of stew made from kale that is especially nutritious. 
But after six months of running, he finally figured it out one day. When he went to a grade school race and the children were running barefooted in their school uniforms and representatives from Nike were there and Brooks were there and Reeboks and Saucony and every other shoe company that you can imagine were there at this race for grade school children running barefoot in their, in their school uniforms. And they were there with stopwatches and on this particular day, at the end of a three-mile race, two 13-year-old girls were invited by Nike to join their training program. And for that, they got food, shelter, education. Finn said, after the Lewa Marathon, one of the women who had been training with them, 26 years old, not especially gifted Kenya runner, but she placed. In placing for the Lewa Marathon, she received a cash gift, enough to pay the rent for she and her mother for five years and buy food for every member of their family. And if you are really gifted and you can win one of the world's great marathons, and if you can get a shoe contract, you can come back to Kenya and build a school. And with that school comes food for those children who are enrolled. Finn said, it's not all about the altitude. It's not about the running style. It's not about the culture. It's about survival. And it's about running hard enough and fast enough to provide for the people you love. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. We are not really all that much different than the Kenyans. You take away our daily bread and our whole attitude's going to change. We're not all that different than those wandering Israelites wandering around the Sinai desert looking for something to eat and then going out on that more first morning and finding, sticking to the leaves, the tiny leaves of the tiny desert plants, this manna, this bread-like substance, this bread from heaven that they plucked off and ate and they were told, don't keep any leftovers, it'll spoil. The Lord provided enough for this day, three and a half quarts for every person out in the wilderness. And they gathered that up and they ate that. Their daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And the scripture is very clear, both in the Old and in the New Testament, that one of the ways the Lord shows that he loves us is by giving us food. Jesus is out teaching with his disciples and he'd been out all day long and there's a crowd that's gathered and the scripture says in Mark that they were like sheep without a shepherd which is not a compliment by the way and Jesus kind of organized them and he told them to lie down and sit down on the green grass which sounds kind of familiar with David's psalm and then when they laid down and sat down in the green grass. Jesus taught them for a while. And he said to one of the disciples, you need to feed these people. And they said, oh Lord, how could we possibly feed these people? It's too late in the day to send them out to get food. So Jesus instructed them to bring what they had. And they brought what they had. It was five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus stood before the people and he started tearing it. And we don't know if it was one of those cases where the more he tore, the more there was, or if he just stood there and began tearing and suddenly it multiplied. But whatever it was, these sheep without a shepherd sitting on the green grass were suddenly being fed as Jesus tore this food and it was spread throughout the people and when they finished, they gathered it up and there were 12 baskets of leftovers. Out of his love for them, he fed them. And if you reach back into the Old Testament, you find from the prophet Isaiah the teaching that when you know the Messiah, you will know him by the food he brings to the table. If you would, turn to Isaiah chapter 55. In the first two verses, 
Ho, everyone who thirst, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me to me. Eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Isn't that interesting? Writing three to two, three thousand years ago on papyrus, the prophet says, Why do you not invest in the food that sustains you? You see, he's speaking to our culture just like he was speaking to their culture because we're no different really. Here's what we want. We want cheap food, cheap water, cheap energy, cheap necessities so we can have disposable income left over to buy the fun things that we want. We want to buy cheap food and cheap gas and cheap water so that we can spend extra money on more clothes, more technology, different car. You know, have you seen those commercials for the iPhone? And have you seen the commercials mocking the iPhone? The commercials for the iPhone even promise the next one's going to be better. The one a year from now that you're going to want to spend another $600 for is going to be better than the one you just bought today for $600. And then there are the commercials that mock all the technology from one to the other. And the thing is that when you buy one of these other phones, the technology in that phone is going to seem rather primitive by next year. So you just get on this treadmill of having to have the newest and the latest and the newest and the latest. And pretty soon you find out it's just really pretty empty trying to keep up with this thing. Isaiah said, why? Do you not invest in food that sustains you? Back to the New Testament. On the Sunday after Jesus was raised from the dead, he catches up with two disciples, two followers of his. We're not told who the disciples are. Two followers of Jesus. They're walking down the road and they're discussing the events of the weekend and they're extremely sad. And Jesus, unbeknownst to them, walks alongside and asks them what's been going on. And they say to him, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's been going on. And they fill him in on the gaps of the crucifixion of the one we thought was going to be the Messiah. And as he makes his way along the road, they discuss it. They come late in the evening at their destination at Emmaus and they say to him, come in. Have dinner with us and you can go on your way in the morning. So Jesus goes into the house with them and it says he sits down at the table and he starts tearing the bread. And when he tears the bread, they recognize him as he's providing the food. St. Augustine said in one of his sermons in the fourth century that when the preacher prays over the bread of communion, There's nothing special happening or extraordinary happening that changes the bread from this into that. He said what is happening in that prayer of thanksgiving for the bread is that perhaps you are noticing that this bread looks strangely like the bread I had for breakfast. And maybe it dawns on you that there's not that much difference in the holiness of Sunday bread in the holiness of Monday bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Stanley Tushy is Meryl Streep's favorite co-star. He's been in a number of her movies. He was her husband when she played Julia Childs. Stanley and his wife and his parents have written a new cookbook. And I read an interview that he gave concerning his cookbook and he said, the world doesn't need another cookbook. He said, there are only so many recipes 
just like there are so many plots to the story. He said what makes the difference is how you tell the story compared to how the other guy tells the story. And this book is the story of how our family loves one another through food. And then his mother followed up on the interview and she said, food is how we tell people we love them. Give us this day our daily bread. And then that evening, Jesus took the bread at the table and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Give us this day our daily bread. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we approach this table with, with reverence and thanksgiving that you daily give us our daily bread and that by the gift of food you have given us a symbol of your love for us. And Lord, I pray that as we take this bread and drink this juice, we are reminded of your love for us in the gift of your Son. Lord, bless our time of communion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And we welcome all of you who believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to join us in our communion this morning.